professors Helen Bond and Joanne Taylor. And today we'll be discussing uh, their book, Women Remembered, Jesus' Female Disciples Remembered. Yep. I'll have a link to it in the description. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Oh, well, thank you for having thank us, Jacob. Great to be well, here. So I, I want to start with this question. Who were the female disciples of Jesus, and what do we know about them? Helen, do you want to start? Or do you want to... <laughs> we, we well, do who were they? Um, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, what we do in our book is to sort of look at... Um, we're looking for tiny references sometimes and, um, you know, looking for those women who've been overlooked, but it's very easy to miss them in the text. I mean, some of them are there in plain sight and people have just kind of moved over them quickly, thinking they're just sort of light relief. But um, but we're, we're, we're wanting to look at all of the female references and try and work out who they might be, what they might be doing and, and why their story hasn't been told. So you get plenty of them in the Gospels. Um, Lots of women who are mentioned right at the end, for example, in Mark's gospel. And suddenly we're told that they've been on the road with Jesus all the time. Um, Luke mentions the same women, says that they've been um, helping Jesus and, the, and his movement from their own resources. Um, the women are there throughout Jesus's ministry and particularly there at the end from the, the crucifixion. They see the place of burial. They're there at the, um, at the empty tomb. They're the first witnesses to the tomb and the um, and the risen Jesus. And then they're all over the place in, in Paul's letters, Romans 16. Paul, called, Paul gives a great long list of, of people like Phoebe and Prisca, Prisca and her husband Aquila, Junia, um, all sorts of people, Chloe's people he mentions in 1 Corinthians. So lots of women are clearly apostles, uh, disciples, leaders of house churches. So they're they're all over the place. It is believed by some that the early church, just as a later church eventually was, uh, heavily um, misogynistic, but uh, but it is pointed out that uh, in Paul's epistles, as you were just mentioning, uh, not only did what are women leaders mentioned, like in Romans 16, but um, Paul seems to contradict the view that are mentioned in the pastorals about women can't speak in churches uh, could you both elaborate on this? Mm, uh, yeah, the really big uh, questions and comments you're saying. Um, I think we wouldn't say um, the texts are misogynistic or the church was misogynistic as such. Um, what we would say is that the church is embedded in a very, very patriarchal ancient world. Uh, it was just normal to think in terms of men being in charge or elite men particularly being in charge um, and that goes right up to the imperial household in the roman empire it's a it's what elizabeth schussler fiorenza calls the curiarchal um, structure it's based on the idea of a curious a lord um, being in charge and then and then that structure goes down to villages where the 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 men who are the the village elders you know the household the the, the man should be in charge uh, a a woman um was supposed to have a, a male legal guardian in ancient judea um it was just that normal in this ancient world that um men would be in charge and even though with um, the, the the Jesus movement and Jesus message himself, it's it's promoting a, a vision that radically overchange uh, overturns that and changes that. The the first will be last. The last will be first. He has come to uh, not to to be served, but to serve. You know, the highest um, ideal is to be a server. However, we would define that a diakonos. Use the the masculine term. Um, it, it, it's very hard for people to get their head around that, even today, you know, and that is a really, really difficult message. So in uh, the ancient world, that message coming through, getting embedded in different Christian communities, then translated into 
our texts and going on through time, you know, in terms of praxis, is just a really difficult job, you know, to, to do that. And so we kind of, we, we, we recognize that, that the texts are androcentric, curiarchal, and they're shining the light on the men, even though the women do are allowed to appear sometimes, as, as Helen, you know, indicated, they are there. Um, the, the, the texts don't want to, to give us the whole story because actually in the ancient world, it didn't look great. It didn't um, sound out that the, that the Christian movement was, was particularly good in ancient terms to have leadership of women, to have a lot of women in the room. So it's better to, to shine the light on the men. And as time goes on, you know, in, in terms of Christian survival, it's considered better to have a church that is run by men in a man's world. That, so that's a, a long answer to what you're saying. So um, just to be defensive about the, the church, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to ask about a particular verse in the uh, first Corinthians that also uh, uh, makes mention of uh, women cannot speak in church and, uh, and it parallels something. And I can't remember if it's in first or second Timothy, uh, but one of them uh, in which women in that text and this other text are being uh, are, uh, are the text is saying that women cannot speak in church. So do you both think that that was actually added in first Corinthians? I know some scholars think that it is original. But I don't yeah, we would that. say that it was added as, as, as Joan says, I mean, you know, in the early period, you get pl plenty of evidence for, for women being, uh, uh, being very active in, in Christian circles and, and no one seems to find a problem with it. You know, Paul doesn't seem to have a problem with it in, in, in uh, Romans 16. By the time you get to the maybe early second century with the pastoral epistles, they're, they're, they're reining back on women. They're wanting them to look respectable, you know, know your place, don't be out of place in a sort of a Roman um, context. And, and and they're all about how the church looks to outsiders. So, uh, the most likely thing with this this little passage in 1 Corinthians 14 is that it's simply been added later. And we know that this happens a lot. You know, somebody comes along, they write a, a comment in the text, in, in the margin, and the next person comes along and copies it and thinks, oh, you know, does it belong here? And, and somehow it gets stuck into the text. And there's pretty good evidence that, um, that this is actually the case because um, Joan can maybe remind me of his name. We talked to a, a, a really... Philip, Philip Payne. Payne, that's right, really yeah. nice and interesting uh, uh, text uh, scholar who had done work on the manuscripts and, and he'd noticed that these ancient manuscripts sort of use little markers when they know that something isn't actually part of the main text, but they found it in the margin and they're going to write it in anyway because, you know, it's in a margin, it's in the sacred text, so they think, well, we better keep it because somebody wrote it in and, you know, this is an important bit. So so he's found those markers in manuscripts of, of 1 uh, Corinthians around this bit. And also when you look at the textual evidence, that little section can be in different places in 1 Corinthians 14. And that's always a good indication that actually it's not an original part. It's been put in the in the margin and, and it's been maybe sort of copied into slightly different places by different scribes. So, yeah, I think both in terms of the content it, it 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 rings strangely you know the Paul who has just said in chapter 11 women can speak in churches they can prophesy in churches as long as they keep their heads covered is very unlikely to be saying three chapters lately oh you know say nothing um so the content is odd but again there's there's actually evidence that that suggests that it is a later edition so um yeah that's what we would say with about that one Do we know how the historical Jesus viewed women based on his interactions with women like Mary and Martha in the Gospels? Mm. <laughs> the Mary and Martha story is a tricky one. Uh, it can be interpreted in different ways. But yes, um, Mary and Martha come into the Gospels of Luke and John, and uh, they just appear as important figures. Uh, especially in the Gospel of John, uh, Martha and Mary really get Jesus in a way that um, no one else does. It's, it, they're very, very important figures there. 
um, and he he stays with them. Bethany is a is his kind of home away from home when he's uh, around uh, Jerusalem. So we've got a whole backstory of Martha and Mary that is just not being told. I think, you know, we've just got to, to be aware that we're only being given the edited highlights of, of Jesus' actual story in the, in the Gospels. So um, Martha and Mary in the Gospel of Luke, it, it's, um, it's turned in different ways. And of course, um, in the early church, they, they, they started to think about Martha as representing the active life of service and, and Mary representing the contemplative life of, of uh, service, um, really the sort of prototypical nun, um, uh, very submissive and, um, and, uh, and contemplating Jesus. But actually, um, in that story of Martha and Mary, it's a very, very complicated little passage about what is actually going on between Martha and Mary, between Martha, Mary and Jesus. And it probably implies there are a whole lot of other people in the room as well. Jesus, when he enters um, in, in the Gospels, when Jesus enters a town, when Jesus enters a, a, a place, um, other people randomly pop up, you know, other disciples do pop up as well. It's just the, the focus of our Gospels is on, on Jesus. Um, and Martha is serving um, well, clang, you know, that, the important word um, of serving is actually what Jesus wants everybody to do, um, to serve as he serves. And she uh, and the word used, diakoneo, is this, this language of service um, that indicates Christian leadership, in fact. So, so really, what is going on? She may very well, as part of her service, be, be serving food, but that's a really, really important job for those who are serving Jesus to serve others. And who is she serving, I suppose? You know, is she just serving Jesus? Is she serving others? Is she serving both? You know, Martha is, is very important. But Mary is really, really important too, because that term sitting at the feet of doesn't well, it does literally mean you're sitting on the floor and and someone is sitting in a chair, but um, that's a technical term for being a disciple. So while we don't have a, um, a, a actual um, female disciples named, they are female disciples. When you have a text saying that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, that indicates her discipleship of, of Jesus. And she's listening, quietly listening to her. And it's about the priorities. It's something about um, a message to everybody, men and women. It's not just a, you know, these are female role models. You women should be submissive. It's, um, it's about listening to Jesus first. You, you do your service. You, you listen to Jesus first. And, and, and that actually makes Mary and Martha very, very important as paradigms of discipleship for, for everyone. But having said that, you know, we do in, in our book indicate that there are different ways of interpreting this. Um, but we just want to insist that um, as disciples, they are very, very important. And this can be uh, read as a very positive story for everybody. In the in the days of the early church, were women leaders um, equal and just as authoritative as the men were? We don't have very much information about it. That's the trouble. I mean, when the the period we're particularly interested in, the sort of the early New Testament period, I mean, what's really distinctive about that, I think, is that, you know, these people are expecting the end of the world to come pretty soon. You know, there's this idea that that, that the, the end is nigh and you've got to get out quickly, you know, take the message around, convert people. Um, and, and, and that makes Christianity a sort of early millenarian movement. And in that kind of movement, you tend to get um, more egalitarianism than, um, than, than once, once uh, movements become more, more sort of bureaucratic and structured. So, so the, the problem is, as soon as Christians realize that the end of the world isn't coming quite so soon, they, they do start to realize they're, they're, in, they're in the world for the long haul. They've got to start thinking about what they look like, conforming to the structures. Of, um, of, of the rest of the world around them. And as soon as they're doing that, and as soon as they're worried about what the outside world thinks about them, then I think 
you know, women's leadership is probably doomed. But um, but there are certainly um, always indications of women who buck that trend. You know, you hear of women martyrs, for example, who um, who still manage to get a voice out in the public and are and are and are. Um, you know, witnessing as, as martyrs, um, we have evidence of, um, you know, charismatic women in second century and beyond. Um, we have w evidence of women leaders, um, women nuns who still managed to, to exert some leadership role. Even um, one of the things we 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 saw in a documentary we did um, about women, uh, Jesus's women, um, was a, a sixth century mosaic in Naples in the catacombs there of a female bishop. So. So clearly, despite this sort of the dominant story, which is kind of always the easiest one to tell, there are always women who are pushing against that. And, and somehow, because of their personality, because of the place where they are, because of the other people around them, uh, manage to, to get heard and, and to be still in a position of leadership. What do we know about Joanna mentioned in the Gospel of Luke? Uh, um, not a lot, but it's very rich. What we do know about uh, Joanna, the the wife of of Husa, who's a that's a Nabataean name. So you can imagine some sort of Nabataean backstory there. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, she's one of several women who are with Jesus on the road in Galilee, and um, these women are in some ways supporting Jesus out of their own resources. So it implies she has some resources in, um, and, and is, is serving, you know, serving with, with resources. When we were making the documentary, we sat in the um, theatre in uh, Tiberias for quite a long time and imagined Joanna's life. And, and Helen and I just did a lot of brainstorming about Joanna um, <laughs> on our Tiberius days. Um, and uh, we, we can basically tell you an entire backstory of Joanna from our, from our mm. kind of brainstorming and sort of creatively thinking about what her life would be like. Um, and, and it's a life of luxury. Um, if you sit in that theater, you, you're aware that if you're in the court of Herod Antipas and Tiberius, and we assume that's that's who's meant by Herod here, um, that, that you're 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 um, in this this rather refined environment. Husa was Herod's steward, and that um, indicates that he was very high up in terms of the administration, the management of his estates. And so she would have enjoyed a very good lifestyle in, in Tiberias um, and elsewhere where the, the Herod entourage went and, and his other places. Um, but uh, there she is out on the road with Jesus in, in Galilee. And it says that she's among women who were healed of various infirmities and diseases. So this is where, you know, there's some kind of call or, or change for Joanna and the other women around who have experienced Jesus' extraordinary powers of healing. And they would have and, and Joanna herself would have become um, a, a fantastic example of, well, she would have been someone who could witness to Jesus' healing, witness to his message, speak to other women, and her position itself as being so high up in the, in the Herodian court, and then joining Jesus in Galilee would have been absolutely extraordinary to people. You know, we're talking about, as we said, you know, a world where uh, kuriaki patriarchy was was the norm. Uh, what on earth was a woman like that doing with Jesus out on the road in, in, in Galilee? So it just goes to show how radical Jesus was with women, actually, if Joanna was with Jesus. I want to shift to uh, Mary Magdalene. I know that there are a lot of later church legends written about her, but she's going around with Jesus and she's hanging around with Jesus a lot in the Gospels and later on the church. Some documents claim or hint to being her being his wife or pretty close to it. 
What do you both think about this? <laughs> well, I think it's very unlikely Jesus had a wife, um, and um, and I don't think it was Mary either. Um, I mean, the main reason for not thinking Jesus had a wife, actually, is that Jesus has this apocalyptic message. He says the end of the world is coming. It's around the corner. And it seems an odd thing to do in a culture where marriage is largely for the raising of children to then settle down. I mean, that's not to say he might not have had one in Galilee and he sort of, you know, in, in Nazareth that he he left or that died or something like that. But it seems very unlikely to me that that Jesus was sort of, you know, trailing around Galilee with a wife in tow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the difficulty with Mary is that, that the, the Gospels themselves tell us so little. It's actually really intriguing how little they do tell us only that she's there with Jesus as one of his disciples and that she's she's had seven demons cast out of her, Luke says, um, that and 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 then she really comes into her own in, in the passion narrative where she's there at the cross and she's she's sort of the the link between uh, Jesus on the cross and she sees she and others see him being buried and then she and others come back to the empty tomb. So they make it very clear that the Jesus who died was buried and that, the, that you know, somebody came back to the very same place. Um, so that's what they really tell us. But um, we, we think um, that there's a, a whole other story there that um, we're not being told about, particularly in terms of um, Mary being in some way sort of a leader of the of the um, a, a sort of a female mission. I mean, when when you think about that, the kind of um, society that that Joan has described, um, somebody like Peter couldn't just go into a house into the women's quarters and you know start to baptize them or anoint them with oil or touch them in some way. They would have needed uh, women to go to them and 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 spread the news, and so it seems very likely that that Mary and other women are part of this sort of parallel women's mission. Um, we have ideas about her name and various other things, but I'll maybe let uh, Joan tell you about that because that's that's <laughs> I don't want to steal her thunder on all of that. Oh, uh, steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, um, the, the yeah the, the name Mary Magdalene um, that, that often it's said that it just means Mary of Magdala. Um, so there's this whole idea about this place called Magdala and uh, or Magdala that she she came from. Um, but actually the evidence for this supposed place is, is pretty thin. Um, it might refer to a a, a, a place called. Um, Magdala, the, the, and that just means tower, but that's an extremely vague way of referring to someone in terms of place, because there are lots of places in ancient um, Judea called the Tower of Something. So which tower was she from? And, um, and so the question is really whether or not it means something else. Um, is it a nickname that actually refers to her status in, in some way? And in fact, that's what Jerome, um, the great scholar Jerome in the, the late fourth century thought, he thought that the term um, Magdalene, meaning the tower or from the tower, actually uh, indicated her, her, her status as a tower of faith. Um, so, uh, and, and, and that tradition is, is quite strong in the early church, that it was something to do with um, her as a as a person, as a, as a nickname, rather than just meaning uh, Mary from a place called uh, Magdala. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't think that Mary came from uh, Migdal? Uh, well, Migdal, this is it, you know, Migdal what? <laughs> Migdal oh. Sinna, uh, there's this all sorts of Migdal Ada, um, Migdal Gad. Um, if we look through rabbinic literature and early church literature for a place called the Tower, there's a lot of them. And uh, there was a place near Tiberius, um, and it, it, it could be that it was a, a, a Migdal near Tiberius. There are a couple of places actually referred to near, near Tiberius. Um, called Migdal. Uh, maybe um, she came from such a place, but even if she did, it was so obscure. It wasn't actually a, a city. Um, and currently, 
the uh, archaeologists tend to refer to a large city they're excavating on the shores of um, the Sea of Galilee as um, Magdala. And it was certainly identified as a place called Magdala by Christians in the Byzantine period in the 5th, 6th century, and it became part of the pilgrimage stopping route. So fine, it's called Magdala, but it just probably wasn't a, a Magdala in the 1st century. Um, the, Mary Magdalene is remembered as being a, a village woman, and um, in fact, in a, a, a text um, which is responding to criticism of Christianity uh, by uh, a, an early Christian scholar called Macarius Magnus, um, who writes against those who deride Christianity. And one of the reasons they deride Christianity is because Mary Magdalene was a simple village woman. Um, that idea that she just came from some nondescript village, that she was low class, is, is really a very important piece of ammunition against Christianity. And what Macarius Magnus um, says is, you know, he tries to defend her in various ways, but, um, but what he doesn't say is, no, no, she came from a really important city by the Sea of Galilee. So it's, it's unlikely that um, even if she comes from a place called Migdal something, um, it is to be identified with the, the city that they're currently excavating um, by, the, by the Sea of Galilee. They're all the little bits of evidence that do not add up um, to, to uh, mm. what is currently being proposed about that um, identification. After Jesus <laughs> and Paul are dead, what do you both think caused the church to drift away from the women leaders in the movement and them being only scantily mentioned and, and, and the information appearing to be suppressed or something close to that nature? I think it's, it's largely, as we've said already, this, this you know, delay in, um, in the end of the world coming. People were expecting God to come in judgment, establish the kingdom of God. And, um, you know, it wasn't maybe necessarily tomorrow, but it was going to be very soon. And um, and the years pass and and it doesn't come. And, you know, the first generation are dying, second generation. And, you know, it's going on and on. And um, and people realize that they just have to find strategies to exist in this Roman world that isn't always as positive towards them as it might be. And, um, you know, we may frown on that and say, well, you know, they sold out, but um, but what else could they do, really? You know, they later on there was persecution um, and they they had to try and keep their head down, um, you know, try and try and make sure that people weren't looking at them and and um, thinking that they were something strange. And and as we've said already, too, um, you know, having women in a movement, particularly women in leadership roles, women out of control, as outsiders might have thought of it, um, is a sure way of getting yourself noticed for all the wrong reasons. So I think a large part of it was um, was just this delay in um, in the end of the world coming. At some point out that early church art seems to portray women together with men in, in very interesting ways. Um, could you both elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually a really important part of our documentary. Uh, we interviewed Ali Katias, and she's the real expert on this. And she has a website, actually, uh, that shows these images of early Christian women in various different um media that she's found looking at uh, sarcophagi, looking at mosaics um, and looking at paintings on catacomb walls and, and, and elsewhere. And, um, and she very interestingly has chronicled how the, the, the status of women diminishes in art. And that's just a different um, way of thinking about it because we can hypothesize about the status of women in the church diminishing in our texts and we can see some evidence of that but it's so clear in art and it's incredibly clear uh, Ali pointed out how that the figures of women 
actually get smaller. So <laughs> in the sarcophagi, you can see women in, in uh, one sarcophagus, the so-called the Jonah sarcophagus from the, the late third century. It's one of the earliest sarcophagus where um, a sarcophagi, Gina, Jesus is raising Lazarus and it's a classic image of early Christian art, um, much repeated. Mary and Martha are there and a, a couple of male disciples as well. And they're all the same size as Jesus in this sarco sarcophagus. And as you see that repeated through the course of the fourth century, yes, the, the art um, in the fourth century, Constantine, the Roman emperor, takes over in terms of uh, the, the change in Christianity that's incredibly important. He has... Uh, he takes um, the, the line of uh, the military in terms of their form of Christianity. He's a military man. He wins battles with the Cairo, the cross, a form of a cross on the shields of the Christian soldiers. It's all onward Christian soldiers type stuff. Um, and it's very masculine. And uh, this he also wants to actively sort out the church. He convenes a council in Nicaea in 325. You know, we're getting a heavy-handed imperial involvement in Christianity. And we can see in the fourth century things changing. The fourth century, coincidentally, is the time of our most important Christian manuscripts written by uh, the people who have a lot of money to write beautiful manuscripts. So we've got uh, to be a little careful with our manuscripts as well because they come from this time. But anyway, back to art. Um, the, the figure of the, of the woman diminishes in that scene, the raising of Lazarus. And so Ali has pointed out that in the end, the, the image probably of Mary, um, uh, who's still retained, Martha just gets deleted um is is a tiny little figure crouching down of very very little importance and the story is all about jesus who is depicted as a kind of dionysus god figure um and and women are of, are of no consequence the, the the male disciples like peter and john still are large <laughs> in the sarcophagi of the fourth century but the the female disciples um, get miniaturized. What is uh what is the deal with the woman with the flow of blood? What is that story about? Uh, what's it about? Um, so a, a woman who's coming to Jesus for healing. Um, the thing about a flow of blood is that it's going to make her impure. So um, she's she's impure all the time. Ordinarily, with impurity. Um, things like menstruation, you can wait until it ends and then wait a week or a certain amount of time. And then you go through a ritual bath or a mik mikveh and, um, and and then you're sort of you're, you're pure again. The difficulty with the continuous flow of blood, obviously, is that it's never going to finish. So you can never be made clear. And um, and Mark says that she'd spent all her money on doctors and, uh, she, um, you know, she, she, she was still um not 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 well so i mean that that's an interesting story because it's the only story actually in uh and, and only in mark's account where she goes up to jesus she makes up her mind she goes up and she she touches him and he doesn't know anything about it mark says that his power went out of him so it was almost as if jesus isn't in control of his power the other gospels change that and and suggest that you know jesus knows already that she's touched him and um and then he he sort of you know agrees to it and and, and heals her but um but in mark's gospel she's um she, she touches him and it is almost like he's some sort of sacred talisman she touches him and she's made pure so instead of her impurity making him impure, which is the normal state of things. If you touch a menstruating woman, you become impure yourself. It's almost as if Jesus's purity is contagious and she then uh, becomes pure um, by his by, by having touched his his garments. So not even him, but, you know, just just his garments is enough to do that. So so it's, it's a pretty powerful story. Um, and yeah, an interesting one. And, and certainly in Mark's gospel, it's interwoven with the story of Jairus's daughter. And so Jesus, Jesus 
makes this woman pure, sort of symbolically, I suppose, bringing her into this sort of pure world of the kingdom of God. And um, at the same time, or, or, or shortly after, he raises this little girl up as well to sort of to new life. So there's all these ideas of salvation and raising up and purity in the two of them. But I think she's she's just a good example of yet another woman in the crowd, um, a woman who's had some wealth at some point because she spent it on doctors. She's maybe not not very wealthy now, um, but she's another of these women who are out and about in the public world um, and able to to, um, to to be close to Jesus. Who's the woman that taught Jesus? Who's the woman who what? <laughs> In page 87, uh, the, you, know, you both mentioned a woman teaches Jesus. Oh, you mean his mother? <laughs> oh. Or the Syrophoenician? Uh, or the... or So many women. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a Syrophoenician. It was a Syrophoenician, yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, all right then, yes. But we can we can think about Mary as a, a teacher of Jesus too. Um the Syrophoenician woman story, it's, it's another amazing story. There are these incredible stories in the Gospel of Mark in which uh, women are unnamed. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, too, there's lots of stories of unnamed women who turn out to be incredibly um, important. And there was just to sort of say about naming. We, we have quite a thing about naming. We like to have <laughs> um, named characters, and they're the important ones. We do. We Actually, like names. Yeah. And so we, we, you know, we think Joanna, Mary Magdalene. Um, but but strangely, in the in the Gospels, the unnamed characters can be the really important ones with, with the great insights, uh, whether it's a blind man who's healed by Jesus or all these um, women. And so um, and we have to remember that these women were likely um, uh, able to tell their story and would have told their story and their stories actually come from their their telling their own telling about their experiences uh, not necessarily from outsiders actually the woman with the issue of of blood you know her story of oh you know I've I spent all my money for all these years on, on doctors is the sort of thing that you would expect her to say herself because no one would have known it it's not something anyone would have known unless you, you'd had her story told so part of being part of the entourage of Jesus telling your story um as we have in in Luke 8 with the the women on the road with Jesus who have been healed of many diseases um that that this is the sort of story that they would have told the the story of the woman with the issue of blood or or even the Syrophoenician woman you know who is who is looking for healing for her child um and 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 Jesus says this rather extraordinary thing of um, that he's he's come to for the for Israel he's come for um, he's not really come to the Gentiles and it, it sounds like he, you know he's got a really clear plan you know this is that this is where he's he's at um, and and she knows really that the, the the gentiles can be referred to as dogs and, and that is documented um and it, actually it's a slur that um that continues on into modern times in the middle east for those who are who are not of the faith um to refer to them as as dogs and it's um and and jesus says you know i, I don't want to throw things the, the, what's intended for the children of Israel to the dogs and and she says well um you know the dogs eat what's under the table um you know it, it's okay <laughs> you know I want it too I want to be benefiting from what you're giving out here and um and and Jesus accepts that and his his and her, her daughter is, is healed. And so it's the most extraordinary story of, of Jesus talking to a woman who is not even um, a Judean woman, a Galilean woman, who um, can talk back to him. And it indicates that there's a kind of pattern of conversation that Jesus isn't just coming in and being 
you know, I am speaking, everyone listen to me and I know everything, that he actually talks to people and wants to hear what they say and will learn from them and will even learn from a, a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician, a Palestinian woman um, who is not worshipping the, the God of Israel. It is it is really amazing. And it's also a, a healing that takes place um, remotely, which shows, you know, we're talking about Jesus healing power, the the, the Holy Spirit, this, this power that can go out of him, it's channeled through him. But the channel, the channels go <laughs> very far. You don't even have to touch the 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 cloth that Jesus is wearing. Um, he can sort of fire off this power, and um, and someone remotely can can be healed. So it you know it ultimately tells you how amazing Jesus is. But that interaction is just extraordinary. And what does the resurrection scenes tell us about? Um, uh, the women that were at the tomb. Ooh, what do they tell us? Well, I mean, well, the interesting thing about that is that the men have run off, of course, at the at the cross. Um, they don't want to hang around. And, you know, it probably was more dangerous for them. They had been the male disciples, uh, the male followers, um, perhaps more more dangerous for them than than for the women who who do stand there at the crucifixion watching. Um, so I think I think on one level it shows that you know the women had more perseverance than than the men. They managed to hang around longer. Um, they come back uh, a couple of days after the burial to once the Sabbath is passed to, and it's different in in the Gospels. In in Mark, they're going to anoint the body. In some of the others, they're they're just coming to sit by the tomb. In John's Gospel, they're just just coming to be there you know, near to somebody that they loved and, and have lost. Um, John changes that, of course, to just one woman. He just has Mary Magdalene. But but again, that's a sort of a Johannine thing. He likes to, to just have one person where the other Gospels tend to have a few. He likes to, you know, make that, that, um, that encounter with Jesus on a one-to-one -one basis but um but but so again the women are doing slightly different things in in the different gospels in in mark's gospel it's all about being there and seeing the empty tomb and seeing an angel there who who makes it very clear that jesus isn't there anymore he's been raised um in the other gospels though they have some kind of a um a resurrection experience in matthew and in in uh john in particular you have um the extended scene in which uh, Mary Magdalene is weeping outside the tomb and then she sees a man and she thinks he's the gardener. So she knows the tomb is empty, but she's saying, you know, where is the body? Have you taken him somewhere? And then Jesus says her name and suddenly she remembers, she realizes who, who he is. So she is the first, the first one to experience the, the risen Jesus. And then Jesus tells her to go and um, tell the other apostles. So she becomes the great apostle to the other apostles. Um, so that they seem to be kind of the the, the link and a very important link then um, with this really crucial bit of the story. So either they are um, witnesses to the empty tomb or they're also witnesses to the empty tomb and to the risen Jesus. Um, and this is an amazing thing. And it's actually pretty amazing that the Gospels tell this story. I mean, they do bring on the men. They bring on a couple of men just to say, yep, you know, the boys came and they can verify that the tomb was actually empty. Uh, John brings on uh, Peter and the beloved disciple um, just to, you know, just to verify what the women have said. And of course, opponents of Christianity like uh, Celsus in the second century thought this was all completely ridiculous. He said, you know, what are you're you're founding your faith on this this kind of crazy, half crazed woman? You know, you're you're mad. Um, so it so it was quite a risky thing to do. And it does seem to have been something that um, that outsiders were um, certainly raising their eyebrows at. But um, but it does seem to be a feature of the Christian story from from pretty early on. Um, Paul doesn't mention it. Strangely enough, Paul never mentions um, either the empty tomb or the fact that women were the first ones to um, to see the risen Jesus. But um, but whether or not Paul knew it and was keeping it quiet, we don't know. But certainly the traditions we have date from the 70s onwards. 
Well, basically, the New Testament, all the books in the New Testament have different views about women, but for the most part are similar. Ah. <laughs> well, all of us, uh, <coughs> you know, our book was um, very, uh, and documentary is aimed at the, the general public. And um, if we were going to do a really, really in-depth scholarly discussion of um, women in in the Gospels and, and Acts and, and, and uh, other writings of the New Testament, we would have to start off with very in, intense critical work on the text themselves uh, because, in fact, as, as uh, Helen indicated in terms of the resurrection accounts, each writing has its own take on gender. Each writing has its own take on how to present women. And um, so you, you would analyse exactly how women are presented in the Gospel of Mark, Luke, Matthew, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, whatever. You know, you'd have to go through every single text um, and even parts of text to think about whether or not they are added later, you know, what what is going on. So, um, yes, uh, it, it's a complicated story in fact it's a complicated story in terms of that analysis some great work has been done on it um scholars have been looking at the presentation of um women and, and gender in the different books of, of the new testament and we could supply you with the bibliography <laughs> of, of this the, this kind of work but but there's no work which um you would say is just completely woman friendly um, because they all are um, working in some way defensively. And and that whole question of Paul and what is authentic to Paul, mm. what is um, what is material that was written after Paul and, and the Pauline voice, like the, we think the pastoral epistles were, were not written by Paul, but written in his name later. Um, you know, what, what parts of Paul are genuine and what what are edited and you know what what have um come later it, it's such a such a huge question of new testament studies um and so we, we we try and excavate down to get to the most authentic bits that we can then use for history because we're we're historically minded but um, but we we kind of have to go into the text and and excavate them and and find these little bits and pieces and read them in um, in 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 innovative ways in order to really get to that that core history. But the texts themselves, you know, there are reasons why the texts are written in the in the particular way they are. My closing question: um, Do the Gospels? Is there any evidence that the Gospels had previously written sources that did not survive, like take a Q that Matthew and Luke use, uh, that provide or may have provided additional information about women? We just don't know what's what's not survived. Like you say, Q is, is an obvious one. I'm sure they had loads and loads of um of sources that they were using, some of them written, many, many of them oral, and uh, many of these may well have come from women, as as Joan has indicated already. Um, you know, recollections of people passed on, um, stories that they passed out on in particular groups. Um, I know Joan has a particular um, view of the we passages in uh, in Luke, so maybe you want to outline that, Joan. Ah, oh, yeah, no, it's a, it's really <laughs> that the, there's wonderful work that's been done on the idea of a living text of our um, early Christian material, the Gospels that, that, that they um, they developed over over time. So it wasn't just sort of a, something written down at one point. Um, they, they were allowed to flower a little bit over the the uh, first um, maybe first century of their their writing through to the middle of the the second century but yes the wee passages i think jacob and i have actually talked about the wee passages before we <laughs> um but, but some people have said to me well how can you say um 
that there could be female authorship behind the we passages and the Gospel of Luke when the Gospel of Luke can present women in this not so great way, especially, you know, as, as Helen was talking about the the resurrection scene in the Gospel of Luke, the, the women come along and they sort of get immediately trumped by the men. Um, they it's it's not such a pro woman telling um, in the in the Gospel of of Luke, um, but but what I would say there is you know this is this process in the course of of developing what we have as the Gospels um, in the Gospel of of Luke and in Acts and the Acts of the Apostles there there are different stages of the text and we've got this final version and actually the final version of the gospel of luke it's been much talked about um might incorporate a prior gospel that was used by marcion and uh, you know marcion's gospel clearly wasn't the gospel of luke that we have and the early uh, church scholars the so-called church fathers like tertullian thought that um marcion, marcion was editing a gospel of Luke that existed but um, there's a, a certainly a number of scholars would, that would say actually it was the other way around that there was a, um, a a kind of original version that then maybe Marcion developed slightly but it it gets totally redesigned in the gospel of Luke that we have and um, and certainly that's true for the Acts of the Apostles. You can you can you can discern different parts of the Acts of the Apostles and the wee passages, and the later part is a block that um, has a somewhat different voice to the early part of the Acts of the Apostles. So, um, yeah, that's <laughs> me talking about the wee passages and and the building blocks that we have of of what we've got now as our, our texts, which are used in a way which are formed in a way that has um a defensive um mode i think um and that defensive mode is to counter the idea as helen says that um christianity is untrustworthy because there were so many crazy women who were leading it <laughs> Well, thank you both for joining me today. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely to chat. <laughs> Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.